Hi, and welcome to Chapter 5 in our video series, Building a Restricted Heart Rate Clock Program in MATLAB. In the previous videos, we concentrated on solving uh, molecular integrals that were necessary to build the operators we needed uh, to build kinetic energy, elect uh, electron nuclear attraction, and electron electron repulsion. In this chapter, we're going to be putting those numbers together and those operators together to actually solve uh, for the lowest energy state within a given basis function within the Hartree-Fock approximation. Okay. Uh, in this video, we're going to give an overview of the Hartree-Fock Ruthon equations that we'll be needing to solve. If you're comfortable with them, please go ahead and move on to video 5.2 where we start implementing them. Um, but when we talk about where these equations come from and what, what we're trying to solve when we do this, we're going to actually take a step back and go to a more idealized problem that we can solve. And that problem is, let's imagine if the electrons didn't repel and our basis set was orthonormal. If electrons didn't repel or they didn't interact in any way, then we could write a core Hamiltonian, which is just the kinetic energy of our electrons and the attraction to each of the nuclei, so the nuclear attraction operator. And then if we wanted to find the energy levels for that, we would look for the eigenvectors uh, and solve the eigenvalue problem where our core Hamiltonian operating on a column vector in our orthonormal basis set resulted in an eigenvalue times that same column vector. This column vector is just a series of coefficients uh, in multiplied by our uh, orthonormal basis functions. And so we would solve for all of the different eigenfunctions and all of the different eigenvalues and then we would place two electrons in each eigenvalue, so two electrons per orbital. And so the total energy would just be the sum of the m over 2 lowest eigenvalues times 2. Right? Two electrons in each one, we're going to sum m over 2 of them, where m is the total number of electrons we have. So, for example, helium, m would be equal to 2. And we would place two electrons in the lowest energy orbital, and that would be our total electronic energy. Uh, we can write this in a little bit more compact matrix notation. And so we can write H naught C equals epsilon C, where C is now a matrix of eigenvectors. So each column in C would be an eigenvector of H naught. And epsilon becomes a diagonal matrix that's zero everywhere except for the diagonals. And if we look at the nth diagonal element, it is the eigenvalue for the nth column of matrix C. Okay, so that's a compact way of writing this. This was very easy to solve. We just diagonal, we just diagonalize H naught or find the eigenvector for H naught and then look at the eigenvalues and we're done. Of course, um, our basis set isn't orthonormal. Uh, if our basis set was orthonormal, then our S matrix or overlap matrix would be the identity matrix uh, and it's not. And so what we're really solving is a slightly different eigenvalue problem. So we have our core Hamiltonian, and we're looking for a set of eigenvectors such that when we operate on them with our core Hamiltonian, we get eigenvalues times the overlap matrix times the eigenvalues. Okay? And so solving this is really not that different. Um, the first step in solving this is we're actually going to look for the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of our overlap matrix. Uh, we're going to build a new matrix X, which will transform us from our atom-centered atomic orbital basis set into a more delocalized molecular orbital basis set. Right? And then we're going to transform our Hamiltonian by multiplying by uh, X adjoint HX to get H in the molecular orbital basis set. We'll then solve the eigenvalue equation HMO equals HMO times our eigenvectors equals epsilon eigenvectors. Uh, and that's just a matter of diagonalizing this matrix and, and finding the appropriate eigenvectors. And then we can transform those vectors back to our atomic orbital vectors just by multiplying by x from the left. Still, the most important thing here is the eigenvalues. And our total energy in this case is, is still the same. We just look at the eigenvalues uh, of this matrix. And again, we put two electrons into the two lowest orbitals, and, and that's it. 
no problem. Where we come into trouble is, of course, the electrons actually repel each other. And so we have to account for electron-electron interactions. The way that we do this is by building a new operator called the Fock operator. And the Fock operator consists of our single electron core Hamiltonian plus the Coulomb and exchange operators. So the Coulomb operator uh, is an operator which says, given an, an electron in some orbital, in a molecular orbital, uh, what is the average electron repulsion that an electron in a different orbital would feel? Okay, and so that's a double integral, and we've already solved uh, how to calculate the matrix elements for these, but now we're talking about an electron in our molecular orbital. Our molecular orbital consists of multiple basis functions. Okay, and so we need to know what those coefficients are. The exchange integral basically uh, prevents us from overcounting electron electron repulsion. So we're going to take our Coulomb integral and subtract one portion where we uh, exchange an electron in one orbital for an electron in another orbital. Uh, and this is a result of electrons being fermions and requiring that our wave functions be antisymmetric. Okay. The key portion, the key thing to keep in mind here, though, is that these operators, J and K, depend on the actual orbitals that we have. So when we talk about trying to diagonalize this, our Fock operator F actually depends on the m over 2 lowest energy eigenvectors of itself. Okay? So we have a, a transcendental equation. And the way that we're going to solve this is through a, a method called self-consistency. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with a trial set of vectors for C, a trial set of, eigen, of, of, of orthonormal vectors. And we're going to use those that are the ortho, that are the eigenvectors from our core Hamiltonian. And we'll, once we do that, uh, with those eigenvectors, we're going to build a new Fock operator uh, by building our Coulomb and exchange operators. Then once we do that, we're going to solve for our new eigenvectors uh, of the Fock operator. And using those, we'll build the density. And we'll calculate the energy is equal to the trace of the density operator times the core Hamiltonian plus the Fock matrix. Oop. Then, we'll, once we've done that, we have a new energy. Using that density, we'll build a new Fock operator by recalculating our Coulomb and exchange integrals. And then we're just going to repeat this process. We're going to calculate a new energy every time. Eventually, Hopefully, if the, if the algorithm works, uh, we'll reach a point where we reach consistency in our energy. Or in other words, the new energy that we calculate will be pretty much the same as the energy that we just calculated. Once, we, once that happens, we'll say we've reached self-consistency. These equations are, uh, we've reached a stable solution. And we will use that as the energy, the electronic energy of our system. So that's our general plan. Um, uh, if you have any comments or any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. In video 5.2, we'll actually start building the SCF uh, function, which will take the, the Fock matrix, the, we'll take the, the, the core Hamiltonian, the um, basis set, uh, and, and build uh, the Fock operator and start iterating uh, to, to find out what our, our new electronic energy is. I hope you'll stay tuned, and I'll see you then.